Welcome to the CREC Directory webinar. Today, we are talking about the concept of cannabis tourism, hospitality, hotels, and all kinds of fun new directions our industry is going to be taking us. With us, we have Georgie Gordon, membership chair of the Cannabis Travel Association, and Margit Whitlock of Architectural Concepts Incorporated. We'll be introducing them in just a second. I'd like to start with just a little bit about myself. Uh, I am the CMO of Cannabis Resource Corporation, also known as Cannabis Real Estate Consultants. I went to college at Emerson and we in Boston did not have decriminalization yet until my junior year, 2008. And at that point, that was when I went to Amsterdam for a whole semester. I got a very large tour of the countryside and all of its wonderful coffee shops. And at that time, 14 years ago, I was excited for us to come to the US and really explore what tourism means and what a dispensary looks like smoking on site. And here we are 14 years later, finally able to have this conversation, have some experts in the space and be able to say that maybe there's 30 uh, places you can smoke like legally in the US. Somebody please give me an official number. I'd love a follow up there. Uh, the point is it's changing every single day and there are a lot of different models of how it's all going to come to play and, and a lot of that also is related to the jurisdiction and what the rules are that are going to come in so there's a whole balance of art and compliance to making an official quality dispensary uh, uh on-site consumption lounge for me in uh, amsterdam i always saw that when you first walked in you bought your product in its own room and then you would walk into a secondary room that was closed with glass. Personally, I have no idea if that's what the jurisdictions here are going to say. And I look to our experts to tell us, but I saw that consistently happening in every single one was separating the product away from the consumption area. So in the US, I'm sure we're going to have a whole lot more complications beyond that. Hence why we have a 45 minute webinar to explain. I'd now like to introduce our two hosts, give us a quick summary before we jump into Georgie's presentation. Georgie, please start us off. Well, thank you, Roger. Um, I'm sure that that uh, experience in Amsterdam was enhanced by cannabis. And that's basically what we talk about in cannabis travel is how cannabis enhances um, most experiences and is certainly the travel experience. My name is Georgie Gordon. I have a strategic marketing communications company out here in the Coachella Valley near Palm Springs. And in addition to that, I serve as the membership chair for the Cannabis Travel Association International. So I hope to give you some information that might help you in your business or in your personal life um, when it comes um, for me to show my presentation. Margit? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Margit Whitlock. I'm Principal of Architectural Concepts in San Diego. We're a boutique architecture and interior design firm that specializes in hospitality design. And for the cannabis industry, we bring our 30 years of experience in hospitality design to the dispensaries, kitchens, and soon consumption lounges. Awesome, welcome. And I'm so glad to have you both here. We're gonna pause for just a quick moment while Georgie gets her screen share all set up. Okay, and this will be a moment. So just bear with me. I finally figured it out everybody. If you have been to an on-site consumption lounge, please tell us in the chat and tell us the name and location. For me, I've been to the one in Palm Springs. I don't remember the name of it, but I really enjoyed the couches set up that they had. I'm the kind of person that wants to relax and you know, sit on a couch and hang with my friends. And I think that's one of the really uh, exciting futures too, is maybe hang out with my friends that don't consume cannabis. And instead of going to the bar with them, I can invite them to come sit down and watch some TV at a, a location that is comfortable for both of us to both consume or not consume. Okay. I would love to share my screen with you, but I'm having difficulty doing that. So I'm going to do it. You'll be able to see it in just a moment. I'm very sorry. I knew this would happen. I'm so nervous about it in the beginning and now I'm doubly nervous, but- You have about 10 more seconds and I'm sharing my screen and I have it ready to go from your previous presentation. Okay, why don't you share yours, Roger? Because I know you have it. Thank okay. you. Here we are. And while Roger's sharing that, and I appreciate putting up with me here. Um, so I know that I'm, from looking at the list of people that registered for this, I can see a lot of you are um, not 
segmented in the cannabis industry, but you have more of a broader outlook when it comes to real estate, um, property, developing. So I just want to give you just a, a little tidbit here. Cannabis is not like other industries. And when you're going to be dealing with developers of dispensaries or consumption lounges or even grow houses, people are very, very emotionally attached to their product or the plant. So it's something to keep in mind when you're talking about sticks and bricks and the um, mortar that goes behind this. So know that it has an emotional component to it too when you make decisions. So, um, as Roger mentioned, I am the, oh, next slide. I forgot I didn't have the slide. Okay, I am the membership chair of the Cannabis Travel Association. And what the Cannabis Travel Association is, we consider ourselves global, unified global voice of cannabis travel. And we look for advocacy, networking, education to be able to move toward destigmatizing cannabis. And Obviously, travel is one of the biggest ways that people are coming into contact with cannabis for the first time. Next slide. So the facts that I'm going to be um, sharing come from an annual report that the Cannabis Travel Association does. We call it our annual data report. And if you're a member of the Travel Association, you have access to that report. And I can share some specifics with you after the meeting this afternoon, if you'd like some. Um, numbers are not my strong point, so I won't tell you exactly how many uh, dispensaries are in each place, but I can certainly tell you about them. So the most desired destinations domestically for cannabis curious, cannabis friendly, cannabis aficionados to travel are just absolutely in line with traditional travelers select for their travels domestically. And that's New York, Florida, Las Vegas, and of course, California. Next slide, please. So internationally, well, Roger's already mentioned one of these places, but Canada, we all know that it, uh, uh, cannabis has been legal in Canada for quite a while. Jamaica, Thailand, which is a big booming area for cannabis and also CBD. Um, spas, Amsterdam, and now Mexico. So those are the destinations people are going to. And you can, yeah, I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the evolution um, of the Cannabis Lounge. I can actually do that without looking. Um, so the can Cannabis Lounge uh, is what it is. It's a commercial space for adults to legally enjoy marijuana promise products on the premises. We all know what a bar is. People usually go to a bar to socialize, to talk with their friends, to have some adult beverages. And the cannabis lounge is really set up to do much of the same, except that the product there is cannabis and not alcohol. In fact, cannabis lounges cannot at this time serve any alcohol. They, that's one of the biggest um, and most consistent regulations that there is. Um, there are 37 states where cannabis is medical or recreational and allowed to be used, but it is not yet legal to consume in public places. And that's what the consumption lounge is oriented toward. Next slide, Roger, thank you. So licensing requirements are so all over the board. Um, and so what's happening is everybody's kind of developing their own until we are federal, federally legal, this is going to happen. But we still need places for folks to enjoy or use cannabis in a sanctioned space, which is safe for them. And we found that having a lounge area is actually starts decreasing the black market uh, of the cannabis industry, which is really one of the biggest detractors right now. Um, it's a great destination for people to visit. Um, if they're staying in a hotel and they, and they can't smoke um, in the hotel, they can go to a cannabis lounge and enjoy cannabis there. Of course, there are other ways that people enjoy cannabis besides smoking. 
edibles and so forth. And there's even some regulations that are coming on about how much edibles could be sold in a cannabis lounge because folks, they can't regulate. Um, there's no dram law yes, yet for cannabis. So it's hard to regulate with the edibles that people have been imbibing and then they get into their car. So these are some things that cannabis lounge proprietors are having to deal with. Um, I love the concept of getting off black market sales and helping support there. You know, if there's an obvious place where you can smoke and sit down and sit, that, that would make a big difference. It, it, it really would. In fact, I was entering a dispensary and some guy right outside the dispensary said that he could get it for me cheaper, which I thought was pretty bold that he was selling it right out in front of the dispensary. So the other thing is I have that one it more is point, Larry, okay. don't mind. Where are we able to legally smoke? Where are you able to yes. smoke? Currently. You can smoke in your own home. Um, that if, if it's legal in your uh, community, you can smoke in your own home. Um, and there are places designated where you can smoke and we'll be talking about there. There's certain events that have special licenses. There are of course the cannabis lounges. Um, outdoors, um, sometimes you can legally smoke, but as so someone know, comes to San Diego, hmm? if someone travels to San Diego, stays at a hotel, buys cannabis at one of the legal places, doesn't really have a car, doesn't have their own home, they have to go to a park? Well, and that's only semi-legal. As you know, we've all walked around areas and, and, and say, oh, somebody's smoking here. Um, but it's theoretically not legal just outside. You're supposed to be yeah, in a place where you're, you're at home. So and they that's have to find why a friend. They have to find a friend with a home that they can go sit on their couch with them. That's right. And what you'll see <laughs> as we go on a little bit, there are some places um, that are being developed in other places, in other states that are uh, cannabis friendly hotels. So you could travel there and Love smoke it. in your room. And it's not a lot different. Most hotels don't uh, allow cigarette smoke so much now anymore. So um, there is a challenge in that area too. Not that I'm an advocate of, of smoking cigarettes, but it's, it's in those guidelines of no smoking that many of the hotels are not allowing cannabis smoking yet. Yeah, we, we learned that when I was doing butt and breakfast research and wanted to go to Portland and found they had an occupancy of non-smoking you had to have. So you really couldn't do much with lodging as long as half of them were no smoking, which was an extra complicated issue. And it I is a issue. back at you, apologies for interrupting. Inter no, no worries. Um, actually, it's interesting. You'll find that uh, cannabis lounges are actually a tourist draw. As an example, since many of us here are Californians, there is a community which is really big on cannabis uh, dispensaries and lounges, and they are using that to draw people to the community and it's that world famous community of Modesto. So there's a huge Visit Modesto campaign. And if you uh, Google that, you'll see a lot um, that how they use the cannabis plant as one of the draws for tourism. Um, and finally, it's we can, and we can move to Dennis Perot now because this is about medical uh, use, but it does give um, people that have medical conditions that want to be able to use marijuana and they're in federally funded housing or other situations where they can't use it, um, cannabis lounges can be set up for that. So just a real quick history here. Dennis Perone, um, if you're old like me, you will know his name. He was really the father of the legalization of medical marijuana. His partner had AIDS and struggled for a long time with all the horrible pain and suffering that goes along with that and discovered that cannabis could ease his life considerably. And so Dennis took on that responsibility and that mantra and moved forward in getting cannabis legalized. He did, wasn't totally successful, but he did open up a lounge. He called it Sensamia Salon. And it was a place where um, medical patients were using cannabis, advocates, and other people could come and smoke. It was not legal, um, but it was kind of hidden as a, as a known speakeasy. And it did get raided a number of times. And in 1998, they shut it down. So then there's been a big gap and we can go to the next slide. Um, but here's what sort of happened. Nothing happened for a long time except people having clandestine lounges and areas where people knew it was cool, you could go and nobody would bother you. But in 2019, Alaska became the first state to license marijuana consumption lounges. 
and at dispensaries. So they were really the harbinger of this whole movement. And in 2020, um, Illinois said that you could consume in certain places, but we couldn't be sold there. And that's where you go back to your story, Roger, of having the glass, the separation between where you purchase and where you smoke. But in Illinois, it's BYOC, bring your own cannabis. In some of the establishments here, they won't let you bring any of your own. So you have to know about the regulations area by area. In fact, even jurisdiction by jurisdiction, because in New York, they set it up so jurisdictions could opt out of having um, cannabis lounges rather than opt in. Um, Michigan also leaves it up to the local government and Pennsylvania is another BYOC state. So let's talk about California a little bit. So even though recreational marijuana is technically legal all over California, um, most jurisdictions have the ability to withdraw from this or not, or just not encourage licensing procedures. Um, essentially, as we were talking earlier, people are, sm are barred from smoking on the streets and parks and most business establishments. Um, and in addition to that, then on another layer, the jurisdictions, the cities, the municipalities often put on another layer, layer of regulations. Next slide. So where are most of the consumption lounges here in California? WeHo, West Hollywood, I was just up there, um, in fact, with Marget, and there seems to be a consumption, I mean, a, a dispensary on every corner, and there are a number of consumption lounges there, include, including one a very cool one called the Artist Tree, which I encourage you to look up. And also Woody Harrelson and Bill Maher have an entire new dispensary, and they are building a lounge, a consumption lounge in conjunction with that. The Bay Area has consumption lounges, of course. Here in the Coachella Valley, we have a number of them. Um, and then there are also farm tours, a little bit like wine tours that leave out of the Bay Area and you can consume some on the buses there that take you around at the um, absolute farms themselves. So you have an opportunity to find out what weed is really tasting like from the farmer himself, him or herself. And there's lots of new lounges slated to open. National, National City, La Mesa, uh, in the Central Valley, there's one opening up right away. Ventura County is now becoming more open to consumption lounges. And here in, uh, in this part of the desert, Desert Hot Springs has a couple of dis, uh, uh, consumption lounges and Palm Springs has three or four. And Riverside County is now beginning to have some in the outlying areas as well. So as an example, and I know we've got one person that's attending that also was at this particular event with me, but here's a good example of if you're a broker or a real estate agent um, or an, uh, invest, an investor and you're interested in finding a facility for your client uh, to build his or her dream, we saw this at the West Coast Cannabis Club. West Coast Cannabis Club is uh, here in the Coachella Valley. This one happens to be in Palm Desert. They have three different establishments. Um, it started in a 600 foot garage and the gentleman that owns it had to tell people it was WCCC, but it was West Coast Construction Company. So uh, he kept that moniker for a while and then expanded to some dispensaries and he was working with a broker who shared his vision. He said, look, I've got this huge building. It's a former TV studio, but I think that you could work with it. So they went into this 35,000 square foot building and they made one area, a dispensary. They have a beautiful reception area. And from that reception area in the back, they have their growing area. So they're fully integrated growing and selling. And upstairs in October, they're dispensary, cannabis dispensary lounge consumption area will be opened up then. So they buy your products downstairs at the dispensary and you take them up the stairs and can enjoy them upstairs in the lounge itself. 
So there's one way that brokers have found interesting properties for their clients to um, rent or own. So there, I mentioned earlier that there are 420 friendly hotels. And this is so when Roger travels to Portland, he'll be able to find some place to stay. Um, and I'll sneak down here to uh, High B and B. That's a really good location that you can find out, suss out which properties do allow cannabis consumption. So that is a um, website, High B and B dot CA in Canada. They've been up there in Canada for a while and dot US here. <laughs> yes, we are twenty. So that's a good, thank you for pulling that up, Roger. That's a good example of the kinds of things that High B&B has on there so that you can um, plan your trip just like you would plan your trip if you were just a tra traditional traveler. Um, in Phoenix, the Clarendon Hotel has uh, opened an entire wing um, that's open to 420. Um, you can smoke in there. You can, of course, have edibles in there. You can have in-room CBD massages. So they're, they've dedicated a special wing to it, which is a good direction to go, I think. Desert Hot Springs here is only one example of a totally uh, friendly 420 environment. Coral Cove Wellness Retreat is in Jamaica. And this speaks a little bit to the wellness movement that is also associated with cannabis and uh, THC and CBD, as well as some other cannabinoids. In Denver, um, there's the Clarion Hotel, which is um, totally open to cannabis use. And the Patterson Inn has just opened. It's a beautiful building. It's been open for a while, but they have finally gotten the licensing now to be able to make cannabis um, an integral part of that experience. Uh, but in Breakfast is another place that you can find um, basically bed and breakfast, which are a little different than Airbnbs. Um, that are allowing marijuana use. Roger showed you high B&B. And another one that's very similar is Indica. Indica is a little bit more like Travelocity. Um, it shows you lots of different things in the area along with just staying somewhere so that you can know if you've enjoyed some cannabis, what you can go out and do. George, I think we have about five more minutes for your section. I think that I'm, I'm pretty almost done. I just wanted to touch on health and wellness. Um, this has always been a luxury. We had a couple of questions about luxury travel and health and wellness has always been skewed toward the luxury traveler. Um, but with using THC and CBD and the health and wellness recovery and even psychedelics, which is a whole nother topic, um, most of these places range from very high end, sophisticated, locations to glamping, which is in the middle, to just downright outdoors camping um, events. Uh, I've listed a few places that will help you find events. This is one way that some folks get around the idea of getting a license specifically for a building. Um, you can get a catering license for a special occasion, and that may include cannabis use as well. So uh, Gajasana, 420 yoga retreats, cannabis retreats, Geyser Peak Ranch, which is very cool in Sonoma, and the Alaska Cannabis Retreat. So those are some places that you can check out and see how they're handling uh, the cannabis lounge versus the cannabis dispensary space. So I think that's pretty much what I wanted to share. Um, thank you for bearing with me for the slides. Um, I do encourage you all to investigate this part of travel, tourism, and entertainment with some more seriousness now than you might have in the past. Thanks. So educational. Thank you very much. All right, Margit. That was awesome, Georgie. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Again, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, the chat was turned off for our participants, but you can do it in the Q&A. Okay, so a little bit more about me and my personal experience. So 
have a disabled daughter who suffers from seizures. And in 2018, I researched cannabis as a medical solution to, or option to all the different drugs her doctors had prescribed for her, which was debilitating for her, right? And my experience was really, truly heartbreaking as a parent. Um, from really a scam of a doctor who sold me a medical card for $200 and then gave me absolutely no advice. If I brought my daughter along in this, you know, what I thought was going to be a, an appointment with a doctor familiar with cannabis who would be able to help prescribe something for her, absolutely no advice. Uh, said to go, to, you know, go down to a dispensary to help you. Well, the bud tender sold me some edibles and it made my daughter so high, I was just horrified and I was uh, upset with myself as a parent. Um, there really wasn't any real help for medical patients in California. I contacted people in Colorado, the Charlotte's Web people who had developed, but they couldn't do anything for me over the phone or on the internet. They couldn't, they couldn't give me any advice. They couldn't sell me any product either. So and I'm, I'm telling you this because there needs to be an integrated approach to cannabis, both medical and adult use. And I've kind of made it a little mission of mine. So in my professional life, um, I've reached out to some medical cannabis experts and have asked them how it can design as an architect support both medical and the adult use experience. And um, it kind of was quite a simple, quite simple. So, you know, medical patients need to be advised uh, by an educated cannabis physician or um, physician's assistant. Um, and they need to be followed up by because not all, you know, it's not all one size fits all. Uh, it's, it depends on the medications you're on. It depends on your symptoms and your diagnoses. And um, more is not better. So there needs to be some patient care when it comes to medical cannabis. Um, and so as a dispensary, you want to maybe, if you want to cater to both medical and adult use, uh, what was recommended by um, Dr. Leah, um, who we consulted with, was that you would have a consultation room. So your discussions with your medical professional, your cannabis professional is private, right? And you would have an intake system, an intake protocol. Um, you, would you would try some things that might start very low and you would follow up on a weekly basis and change things just like any other kind of medical, you know, taking different kinds of drugs, you know, pharmaceuticals, you know, you have to try them out. They don't all work, you know, depends, right? So it was really simple to have this higher level of care at a uh, dispensary would really just be to engage a cannabis medical professional, which will cost some money, but there's also, this is a service. So if you have a consultation room, much like a little clinician room um, and have this professional on staff, then and it's by appointment, you know, so that person doesn't have to be there at 724. So it's something to consider if you're going to truly go after the medical patient as a client. I think that's a great point, Marja, because people that are coming for cannabis tourism probably have limited knowledge oh. and they're going because they want to learn more. So it may not be as much about they want to get really, really stoned because they like right. doing it. It's more that they want to learn and be in a safe environment. Right? They need to learn. They need to be educated. There's a lot of information out there. It's like Dr. Google. We all do it, right? Oh, I got an ailment. Oh, but I'm a tennis group. Right. right. We do it, we do it, they do it, everybody does it. So it's, but it's kind of a, there's still so much research to be done and we're making great strides educationally, but. Um, so I just wanted to go over some uh, some design options for, for the cannabis uh, tourism uh, dispensary. Okay, how come I'm not moving forward? I've got the technical problem. Uh, click in on the screen and click right. Oh, Sarah, I'm not moving. No. There we go. I think it was just sticky keys. Excellent. Um, so I wanted to give you guys um, kind of a program rundown, um, but uh, cannabis consumption uh, dispensary integrated dispensary would look like what we, what we call a spatial program. So first of all, 
have an inviting storefront and, and state your brand. Um, be real clear on what your brand is. Depends if you are going after, you know, the Chardonnay moms or are you going after a different demographic? Um, obviously, there's an entry and a security ID check. Um, the uh, retail area has a controlled and non-controlled products and have a very clear merchandising strategy. Um, it's not just throwing stuff up all over the walls and you know, make a path of travel, have certain sections for certain th things or ideas or certain products and maybe a featured product. The consultation room for the medical patients, I highly recommend. Um, you actually have your point of sale, your offices. Um, we've been putting in a, a, a private vendor entry. So the vendors who come in to bring the product, deliver the product and or just have a consultation with this manager about their product. It's a private and secure room. They're not coming through the, the front door. It's, it's usually on the back side, in the back of the house. Um, you obviously have your secured storage, which um, we've been actually doing sheet metal lining on it to, and um, locked and secured just because I mean, we have, you know, this room is kind of on the outside of the corner of the building. We don't want anybody banging through it. I mean, you've seen all these kinds of crazy break-ins to, to jewelry stores. So it's not, a, it's not unfathomable that that would happen. Um, and if you have a lounge, you know, connecting to a lounge, you have to have a variety of seating. You know, you need to have bar tops and the tabletops and maybe some booths and some sofa seating. So, get, you know, so be creative in your comfortable seating. Um, I recommend that you have a VIP room, take advantage of private parties or private sampling. Um, that would be just a nice space. And I, I'm going to show you guys a floor plan later. Um, outdoor space would be great if you can get us get a location that has outdoor space. Um, I think it would uh, be just a really great asset. Of course, you have restrooms in the kitchen. Now, now right now, California, they're not allowing um, food service. Everything has to be packaged like you're consuming in a 7-Eleven somewhere, which I think is absolutely stupid. Um, we've actually, uh, I belong to the San Diego County Cannabis Stakeholders Group, and we wrote a letter up to the Department of Cannabis at, the, at Sacramento and asked them to allow food service in a cannabis lounge uh, for them to change that re uh, legislation, which they are actually working on. I don't know if they're going to do it or not. And then check into waste disposal. It depends on if you're a manufacturing, you know, if you do have integrated with manufacturing, or if you are making cannabis infused products. Like we did a, a cannabis chocolate kitchen. And the waste product uh, from the flour made into oil, then that waste product had to be um, secured and controlled and disposed of in by a service. So um, just check into that if, you, if you're going to go that direction. So let's talk about vibe. I think this is the most important thing to work on when you're designing your, your dispensary or lounge or you know whatever you're up to. So vibe is important, and that's going to go back to your brand. Um, what is it that you're trying to uh, communicate to your buyer and your demographic? How are you feeling? Is this a cool kickback kind of space? Is this glitzy? Is this looking like Nordstrom's makeup counter? I mean, what are we doing and who are we attracting? Um, so I just, so because we're hospitality designers, we always, you know, we're taking our hospitality experience and we're just really driving home design, you know, our spaces. So I really like um, this use of greenery in the, the top slide, uh, the top uh, image of the up here with the little greenery and the little the little cross, and I think that and, and the clean white look and and it's just really nicely done. And I and the one below it with the retail glass that looks very much like a very nice high end cosmetic counter, more or less to me. Um, I put together a little color bird for you so you can see you know what the finishes look like colors look like this is just an imaginary project uh, for you to get a get a sense of what um you know what architects and designers do to help bring your vision to life too um this definitely i see resort lifestyle this is you know when we're talking about outdoor consumption or even indoor consumption we're really looking at a resort lifestyle again it's hospitality driven it's about being social. It's about being connected. So um, go for it and uh, spend a little money on making these spaces really cool. Okay, so I wanted to give you a, a glimpse and a floor plan of what I've been talking about. So basically, we have our secured entry at the top here on the left. 
And we have, well, I put this into two different things because I think that there's um, there's a, a market for the non-controlled cannabis -like products. So this may be pipes, bongs, you know, paraphernalia, to, to hats and t-shirts, to uh, makeup and CBD driven oils or other kinds of products that don't need to be controlled. So I've added in my imaginary dispensary for you guys, my retail area. And uh, this doesn't have to be, you know, 21 and, 21 and up, you know, you could be 18 and, and still go buy, you know, t-shirts and hats and whatever. But then you enter into the dispensary part of it, which is in the controlled substances. And I have my consult room in there. It was, it's not very big. It's a little 10 by 15 you know, have a restroom, you know, I put separate restrooms for different functions. Um, so there's dispensary. And you can see in the bottom bottom left, I have my vendor entry that goes into the office, which then goes into the secure storage. You can see how those are kind of the back of house at the bottom there. And then you would enter into your lounge, I call it the can of bar, um, where we had a variety of seating. We have the booths, we have the tables, we have the long social table, we have kind of the cubby over there in the corner. And we have the VIP lounge at the bottom. And then we have our back of house stuff, which is basically your restrooms and your kitchen. Um, hopefully someday a full service kitchen, which would be delightful. Uh, Roger, I got a question for you real quick. What's the difference yeah. between retail and dispensary space? I think it's the only difference is that it's non-cannabis products, right? Nothing that has a license to be sold. Non-controlled. Non-controlled. No, you know, beauty products and uh, hemp. CBD, um, other health and wellness products that don't have any THC in them can be sold in the retail environment. Um, and then, you know, paraphernalia, is, I don't think it's controlled. Um, and, it, you know, there could be a lot of different things that could be part of that retail market as a, you know, profit center. Well, I love that concept of having other charges, you know, other upsells beyond just selling the expensive taxable product. Right, right. Yeah. You never know, you might have to have your, you know, marijuana leaf hat to go with everything else. Okay, so here's some, uh, here's some of the hurdles, let's put it this way, in the development process. And we've processed about eight conditional use permits for uh, manufacturing, cultivation, dispensary, and the kitchen. And the hurdle is time and money. Uh, most jurisdictions are requiring you to tie up a lease or own the property at the beginning of your uh, at the beginning of the process of getting the conditional use permit. You don't just get a permit or license to sell or you know build the facility uh, just on your merit alone and your business and your partners and your financials and your legals, right? They don't they don't do that. In most jurisdictions, almost all the ones that I've done all had to have the Lease had to be tied up because the cannabis is tied to the space and the space is then tied to uh, the rules, both, both state and local have a thousand foot um, circumference around the whole property to a school or 500 to a church or 500 to another facility um, or a liquor store. So there's all these different uh, development regulations regarding the location. So that's why they, uh, require you to tie up a location. Well, while you're hiring professionals, let's say it's listed here, a civil engineer, and you need a site survey, you need a site, you need to have a bad parking and adequate landscaping that meets the code. You're hiring an attorney, you're hiring an architect, sometimes depending on what you're getting your permit for. So manufacturing and, and uh, cultivation, we had to hire an environmental consultant and an odor assessment, or maybe there needs to be a traffic study because uh, there's a high demand, you know, trip rate on that street. So just get prepared. They, uh, your engineers and you know, basically your architect is usually your kind of your your, your ca captain of the team, uh, putting together the, all the drawings, work side by side with the attorney to help fill out all the forms and the operations manuals and things like that. Um, and then we draw we draw out the plan. So it's usually a site plan, floor plan, the lighting plan, security plan. Exterior elevations, if you're doing building improvements to the exterior, we don't care about interior elevations. 
or cabinetry and all this stuff. They don't care about finish. They just want to look at the building. Uh, and then that, that team, architect and attorney will process that with the jurisdiction. Now, just to give you an idea of cost, uh, to hire all these consultants and attorney and, and submit your CUP uh, could be thirty dollars to $50,000. And it's going to take up to six months. Okay, That just gets you the right to have a cannabis uh, uh, operation in that location, period. You still have to go to the state and get your state license. Uh, then you have to apply for a building permit. You probably are improving the building, adding a bathroom, changing up the layout. Maybe you're adding, you know, maybe luckily you've got your candy bar. So building permit. Um, and again, you're going to hire your architect, your civil engineer, probably a landscape architect if you have a, a, a any kind of landscaping. You know, that's going to cost you another fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars in another six to eight months. Okay, and then you're going to build out your facility. And that just depends on what you're building, honestly. So, you know, large, small, I'm just gonna give you a like 2,500 square foot dispensary at $200 a square foot plus. And that includes some site improvements, 400K. So yeah, <laughs> adding the lease that you're paying for over the period of 18 months, you know, you're looking at 600, $700,000 as an initial investment. Out merchandise, branding, marketing, website, you know, collateral material, just operational startup, your point of sale, your POS, all that stuff. So like any, like any, you know, small business, that's a lot of money to invest. And what if you don't get approved? What if you go back to step one and you don't approve you, you've been out $50,000. So I just want you to uh, know that it, it takes time and money. Um, and I'm hoping that slowly the jurisdictions will let up on that leasehold option that they can get you can get your permit on merit then you go locate a site uh that would save a lot of time people you know and money because they're not holding tying up real estate you know no margit do you think that these costs can change depending on the location of where the facility is oh sure 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 sure, sure, sure. yeah and the building condition say you find a find, find a building and it's just perfectly fine and um, you just need to put in your security cameras and maybe some paint and elbow grease and you're done you're ready to go that's a whole different process so um but with manufacturing and cultivation there like cultivation alone the electrical consumption and the water consumption for cultivation is enormous right and the odor control. So you have a lot of environmental control and you have utility systems that drive a huge expense for cultivation. Um, manufacturing is a little different. It's a really a, a series of, of rooms that move from one to the other. And, um, but that depends on what kind of space you get. You still have to build those rooms out. Um, and have some some secured loading dock and you know depends if you're going vertical and you're doing growing you know cultivation and manufacturing you know so it does you know, it does depend and you know highly advise you get some professionals together just to just to give you some consultation on what do you think about this building what do you think about that building because it may may save some money to but try to find the right building um but they know they really are kind of tying your hands with all these little restrictions on what, how far away from everything you have to be you now to look at both state code and local code. And also every jurisdiction does have a cannabis code. Uh, you just look into building and zoning and then slash cannabis. You now, San Diego building, San Diego, city of San Diego, it'll pop up the whole cannabis ordinance. A checklist will be there, an application will be there to kind of walk you through. So a lot of them are getting more sophisticated and they're actually putting down more information in their website so that people can do better research and and get kind of get ahead of the game if they're considering to be a, a canon entrepreneur and yeah it might not be the first license you want to get you know it that seems like a large amount of overhead you know it might be that the companies that perform better in the future are ones that already have a few licenses under their belt understand how this regulation process is working with real estate agents that can help find viable properties like this because that yeah. is a big number and you are not exaggerating whatsoever right so we you know for a couple of the conditional use permits we did were basically flips they were wealthy investors 
found some buildings, locked them up, got the cannabis licenses, and then leased the spaces out to operators. I mean, they made boatloads of money and two years later, they still had that building. And it was, it was like vacation day. Um, but for this, and that's because we had a bunch of money and they could do it, you know, it was 60,000 square foot building and we locked it into four spaces. And um, yeah, good for them. But for, for a mom and pop, especially in this um, um, social equity, you know, coming into play now and the war on drugs and trying to right that wrong, um, we're going to see a, a different set of players being able to, to come into the market. Um, and that's good news, but it's going to be difficult because they don't have, usually don't have this kind of money. And there's no banks going to loan you this money. It's not like you're going to go get a construction loan for a cannabis business. So. We had a great question earlier too that I wanted to bring up that, you know, your model of retail and dispensary in the same building, while in theory, it sounds great. Um, you know, there are probably a bunch of regulations that are going to negatively affect that. And so it really will vary based on what state you're in. So there probably isn't one main model. Uh, it's interesting how you have to adapt it to each location. For example, in California, you can't have underage persons on the property. I'm hearing this from our commenter. So I'm assuming that's what the exact laws are. And so that's yeah. a challenge. It is a challenge. And also for like the, for the 420 hotel in Denver, Chris is at the Patterson Inn. The way he kind of got around a little bit of that was that the lounge is on a separate legal lot and parcel than the hotel. It's interesting. And the same thing in WeHo, we looked at a large corner lot that had a bar and restaurant and a consumption lounge and a parking lot. And that was two separate lots and legal entities. But they were side by side with a common wall. There's ways to do it. You know, they're smart. Anyway, that's the end of my presentation. I'm looking forward to more Q and A. Yeah, we've got some uh, in the reserves from before, so I can pull up some of those. Um, you know, one of them was like, where is the tourism the strongest, and how do we see the market re responding? And as part of that, we had a question too of more of the boutique styles, and are they going to do better with the smaller hotels? And is there a brand that's kind of jumping into it? Maybe like you mentioned Clarion that sees the market potential and are willing to improve in that way. So where the market is, is the strongest, I think I alluded to that. It's amazing how parallel um, traditional tourism and Canada tourism are as far as where the markets are. That even though Oklahoma is booming as far as the marijuana industry, the cannabis industry goes, it's still not a huge tourist destination. Um, New York, when they opened up uh, legalized cannabis, it just gangbusters because everybody wants, to, not everybody, but people like to go to New York and people that smoke weed like to go to New York. So that um, further enhanced it. Um, California, of course, is tremendous. The Emerald Triangle, where it all began. In fact, there's a even a um, something called the Cannabis Trail, which starts in um, the Bay Area, and there's a tour that goes up th up through um, Sonoma and to Humboldt, to Mendocino, and then Humboldt. Um, and there is a lot of that kind of tourism going on, just like wine tourists. And they're even doing appellations now for weed, so that if you smoke something, you say, "Oh, this must have come from Humboldt during a July." Um, people that they're ganchiers and, and they can really distinctly uh, differentiate between the strains. So there's all sorts of doors that are opening up in this area, um, whether it's a sticks and bricks building or just going out to the farm and having what we would call farm to table if we were eating it, but um, farm to enjoyment for the cannabis. Okay, so what about people that already have a license? You know, they have their cultivation or they have a retail. What is it going to look like for them to include? And, and is maybe somebody who has a retail license going to have a leg up because they have a facility that's more prepared? No, I'd like to say yes. Yeah. I mean, if you have a facility and you only uh, say you're smart about it and you occupy 50% of it as a retail 
you know, and then you're kind of waiting around for the consumption lounge to be uh, brought into the jurisdiction for the opt-in. Yeah, you could add on, if you can tack that on, that'd be great. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, as we're saying, it's not that large across the country yet. Let me change my uh, and so, you know, we tell people that it's often good to have, oh boy, a uh, property that has other uses. So buy a bigger property that you can expand into later. Could it's only to, that you can lease out and get, generate some income off of the lease if you, if you can manage that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and potentially turn it into a consumption or other licenses in the future since you own Mm -hmm. the strip mall or the large so like house. one of the projects i'm working on now the the lot is really large and the building is really small so the plan is to do a cannabis fair in the parking lot bring in some you know cannabis get to get the the event cannabis license as well and to do saturday market at the at the lot Truly, you know, as part of the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, we just, to, you know, just to have, you know, have a little cannabis festival because the lot is so big. And future, they want to build a cannabis lounge on that, that, that extra square footage. Yeah, and we were able to have an event for the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce because we there was a facility that had the ability to have us there because they had they the property. I don't know if they had the official license. I think it was just a private property with no sales happening and just in, invite only everyone signed right. up. So because it was their own property and nobody was selling product at it, they could have an on-site consumption event within the rules. Mm -hmm. So the event side of things I think is a big deal of being able to have on-site consumption. You know, like I, I went to a event at Tyson Ranch which a week prior they go, oh, it's a non-consumption event, but it was like a cannabis festival. And we're like, okay, well, that's like a weird oxymoron. What's going to happen when we get there? Everyone still was smoking still and the cops were turning a blind eye, but you know, they had to put that statement of no consumption here just to make sure they stayed legal. In fact, in Brazil where uh, cannabis is still illegal um, publicly, what they do, they set it up a little bit like Utah used to set up the clubs for um, alcohol consumption. You become a club member and then you can go in because you're a club member and it's a private situation. Then you can and yeah, um, enjoy mm -hmm. cannabis that way. There are lots of workarounds. Yeah. I believe the struggle with that too is where the revenue comes from. Because people are going to only going to pay so much for membership, so you have to figure out other products you can sell, like merchandise, like drinks and snacks and paraphernalia and all the other places where you can bring in revenue that's not selling the product. Most of the time, the membership to those organizations is minimal. You just have to show that it, it's private. Oh, got a great question along this. Uh, yeah, the, the corkage fee concept, or like, do you allow yeah. products in and have a fee? Or do you just let them to bring their own and let them bring their own? Or do you do all sales on? I think it's one or the other, really. Right? I don't think you can. Can you sell it probably and then also tell people they can bring their own? I'd, I'd say you'd say no because there's your profit margin. Yeah, you're losing money. But kind of hard to regulate. Mm -hmm. That was what we experienced in Amsterdam. Yeah, like we generally would go in and buy something just out of respect, you know, spend $15 to buy a product. But if we came in with other product, they, they're not like searching you to make sure that you didn't bring in outside flour and then. Yeah, it's hard to really tell. And that would have been bad for the users as well because they want to be able to kind of consume what they already have. They don't have to go and consume it all in that one sitting. For instance, at the artist tree, what they do is they will sort of rent you a dab kit. You can have a dab at the bar or if you want to sit at your table and do, you know, be dabbing, you rent the kit. You can't bring in your own stuff. They rent you that and they actually limit the stay, which is I don't know how they regulate this, but they regulate, this, yeah. regulate the length of stay. Was it, was it 90 minutes? Right now, if there's not all those people in there, I'm sure you can yeah. stay longer. But you've been at a restaurant where they say, I'm sorry. Yeah, they kick you out. They want to turn the table. Right. Yeah. We have another good question from Courtney. Um, talking about how in California, there aren't consumption licensing and retail is consumption. And that would have... They wouldn't have to get a new license. They could tag team on retail. And that was something we talked about a few months when we were first onboarding. And I remember you saying that was the future, but I'm not sure if that has all been passed or what the situation is. And of course, you had a link that you could share with us. That would be great too. 
Yeah, that would be really great because my understanding is that they that there are certainly separate procedures. Because not every dispensary can open up a lounge. Yeah, it's just saying that you can bring your own glassware yeah. or you cannot bring your own glassware to the artistry. You sign up for 90 minutes or two hour slot and you get to use their own product. It makes sense. You know, it's another place to monetize it. And I think that's really the challenge. You know, it's, if you're selling only product there, you're losing 35% on taxes. <laughs> and uh, there are lots of products with far less sales tax that you can get a higher profit margin on drinks and you know like if someone comes and sits at your store and spends twenty dollars on drinks and fifteen dollars on product because they bought it a gram you know i'd say that's a win because now your your price is now fifty dollars forty five dollars mm -hmm. yeah the artistry was really nice uh, i highly recommend anybody so in weho to take a look at it it's the the first floor is their retail and their dispensary and it was really nicely laid out and they have this really fabulous like revolving part gallery kind of set up throughout the space really neat and then the second floor is the actual consumption lounge and um it's like a on one whole wall it's like it's all floor to ceiling bookcases with these beautiful books and these huge wingback chairs and it's very comfortable and it's like tables for two and it was just really pretty and then they had some some smaller tables with some like higher walls and then you kind of get little more cozy and you didn't, you know, didn't have to be just sitting at like a Denny's, you know, so, and then they had a really nice outdoor lounge um, with the, uh, they have a special mechanical system throughout the whole space and also required by law code there, they have to have outdoor mechanical. So there's no, smoke is getting sucked up, which I think is kind of silly, but it gets sucked up and dragged over the middle of the roof and then pushed up into the sky. <laughs> So what's the difference? Uh, yeah, so mechanical systems are um, pretty heavily uh, designed for consumption. We are now over about an hour. So let's get into our wrapping up statements. Okay. Um, you know, when I was in Amsterdam, I saw a range of places from a dark, dingy basement to a tiki style to an alien style to like the cleanest medicinal look you've ever had. And I think that each consumer is going to have their own style of what they like. Some people like a little grittier and some people want very clean, kind of almost an OCD style. Uh, and so I think that that's the challenge. Um, not only are you having to do your own licensing, you're going to have to develop what style you're going to go after because you're going to alienate somebody, the dingy basement or the really clean person. Um, and I think that's where architectural yeah. concepts comes into play here. And I think it's yeah. helping the owner to understand a design that fits their market right for the branding yeah the branding exercise is very important what is what is it that your message what sets you apart what drives business to you you are your brand image so finish us off with how someone works with you to execute oh, just give me a call <laughs> call me or email me and just let's do a free consultation and see what what you need and if I can help you, I'll help you. And if I know somebody else who can help you, I'll introduce you. That sounds great. Yeah, and as part of the CUAC directory too, we'd be happy to make that introduction. So feel free to reach out to us as well. Georgie, sign us off. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending and being with us for this hour plus. I encourage you all to um, do some research online, take a look at the Cannabis Travel Association International. You might want to get some details there. My email is on there. If you'd like some more specifics for helping you um, develop your business, we also have a virtual toolkit which helps you uh, write letters to regulators and legislatures and the community, which would come in very handy too. All you have to do is plug in your name and address, kind of a thing. So there are lots of options out there for you as you grow your business, whether it's cannabis, totally cannabis related, or if it embraces a multi use kind of situation. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. And you can reach out to me at roger at crec.us, or you can go to our website, cannabisrealestateconsultants.com, and I'll happily introduce you to these ladies and help with licensing and all of the other wonderful things that our organization continues to provide. Thank you guys for joining us. We will be sending a follow-up email, and hopefully you're also watching this months later on our blog. Have a great day. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy, everybody. Bye.